Stay tuned for Lincoln Trial by Fire next on the American Heritage. You put a lot of money into Christmas again, didn't you? And now you want to start saving. Well, to help you do that, here's something to open after Christmas. The United account from UCB. You get unlimited checks and check writing, a safe deposit box, traveler's checks, cashier's checks, money orders, and more, all for just $2 a month. That's bound to save you money. Apply for a United account at any UCB office and have a happy new year. The United account from United California Bank. Vons slashes prices on 3,284 items store-wide. At Vons, we've cut prices, but not corners. We call it Vons value pricing. You still get the same wide selection of top quality foods in a clean environment. So cut your food costs. Shop at Vons. Coberly Ford guarantees every used car. If you're not satisfied, you get another car. Coberly Ford discounts, downtown. A chilling tale of suspense at 10.30. The FBI will not be seen tonight so that we may bring you the following special program. Watch the FBI next week at its regularly scheduled time. In the first fateful year of the Civil War, Union survival rests on the improbable partnership of two men. President in the nation's severest test, Abraham Lincoln is an unlikely leader. A self-taught prairie lawyer whose clothes seldom fit. He's been called a clown, a gorilla, a scarecrow in a corn patch. It also has been said that he is suited for only one role in life, the presidency. A gentleman to the manor born, General George Breton McClellan, is the son of a patrician family, a West Point graduate and classical scholar, reputedly the best educated man in the United States Army. At 34, princely, brilliant, and valorous, he has been chosen by Lincoln to command the nation's first fighting force, the Army of the Potomac. Joined in defending the Union, the President and his general are tragic adversaries on the question of slavery. Their fateful duel of wills can only be resolved in the coming trial by fire. November 6, 1860. Today, in a mounting national crisis, citizens of 33 states have gone to the polls. Hour by hour, returns show a Republican tide across the North. Now, in a small telegraph office at Springfield, Illinois, campaign officials impatiently await word from New York. If it follows the trend, Abraham Lincoln will be the next president of the United States. In a nation torn by slavery, he may also be the last. Though they have had no vote or voice in the outcome, the good Republican ladies of Springfield are impatient for victory. For the first time, a candidate from the raw prairie frontier may reach the White House. <laughs> so nice of you.
New York, Judge. New York has gone Republican, Mr. President. Lincoln's election triggers furious reaction. To Lincoln, to all enemies of slavery, the South makes a stinging reply. The Union be damned. In January 1861, Jefferson Davis leads the Southern Exodus from the United States Senate. In Charleston Harbor, South Carolina, under threat of Confederate attack, Major Robert Anderson braces Fort Sumter for whatever may come. Eager to punish the rebels, Northern election volunteers begin to march to a more ominous cadence. Words have failed. Now men prepare for the dialogue of guns. Thus, hardly believing it would happen, Americans prepare to kill each other. 600,000 men would die. Some to preserve the Union, some to secede from it. Above all, the war would be a struggle of conscience over human slavery in a nation where four million Americans could be bought and sold. The South was ready to risk all to keep it. The North was divided by doubts. Freed, would the black then be a citizen equal before God and the Constitution? Even Lincoln feared the consequences of sudden emancipation, tried to delay decision. Yet in the smoke of a hundred battles, great and small, the decision would become inescapable, beyond the control even of the president himself. Leaving Springfield in February 1861 for his inauguration, even Lincoln can hardly foretell the course of events. He is cast in the heaviest role ever borne by a president. But the drama is not yet written. Riding toward the unknown future with his family, Lincoln himself is torn by doubt. In speeches and celebrated debates with Stephen Douglas, he has denounced slavery, fought its spread into the new Western territories. Yet he has been willing to accept it where it already exists, hoping that time will slowly erase it. Even that distant threat is intolerable to the South. Lincoln's own election has divided the country, and now he must hold it together. Yet a minority president with fewer votes than his combined opponents, Lincoln is hated in the South, often ridiculed in the North. Already Washington is an armed camp fearful of uprising, and even now rumors of an assassination attempt will force Lincoln's secret arrival in the Capitol. Inaugurated under heavy guard, Lincoln appeals for patience. He sends a warning to the Southern rebels. There needs to be no bloodshed or violence unless forced upon the national authority. The power confided to me will be used to hold, occupy, and possess property in places belonging to the government. My dissatisfied countrymen, think well upon it. With you and not with me lies the solemn question of shall it be peace or a sword? Within hours, the crisis breaks. General Winfield Scott and a former Navy officer, Gustavus Fox, report an urgent message from Fort Sumter. The garrison will soon face starvation. 
the choice is clear. Either supply the fort quickly or give it up to the rebels. Captain Fox recalls. To avoid an open fight, I suggested we put the fleet off Charleston Harbor, and then under cover of darkness, supply men and provisions to the fort. But the president refused secrecy. He insisted that we notify the South Carolina governor that we would carry peaceful supplies only. As he told me, it was important that the rebels stand before the civilized world as having fired guns upon bread. The fleet will be too late. At 3.20 on the morning of April 12th, their demands for surrender rejected, a delegation of Southern officers notify Major Anderson that Confederate batteries will open fire on Fort Sumter within the hour. Former Senator, now a Confederate officer, Colonel James Chestnut awaits the final challenge that may destroy the Union. It is 4.30 a.m., April 12, 1861. The war between the states has begun. There is no turning back. Two days later, Fort Sumter falls. A drum roll of disaster begins for the North. In Baltimore, astride the capital's main railway link, secessionist mobs attack a northern regiment, leaving a heavy toll of dead and wounded. Within the week, Harper's Ferry is captured. The great Norfolk Navy Yard abandoned. Missouri aflame as the crucial border states totter on the verge of secession. Manassas, a day's march from Washington. The city is gripped by silent panic. With most of the small Union army scattered in western frontier outposts, the capital is almost defenseless. Fearful of imminent assault, many of its citizens begin an exodus to safety. Assailed by conflicting demands for immediate abolition of slavery or a compromised peace, Lincoln takes command. With but a single aim, to save the Union by a quick war, he calls for volunteers, moves to hold the border states, blockades southern ports, places Baltimore under martial law and ensures the capital's defenses. Now, from an obscure officer in the Virginia mountains, he gets word of the first Union victory. In swift campaign, 34-year-old General George Brenton McClellan, a patrician West Pointer with an actor's flair for the dramatic, has led his Ohio troops in the successful invasion of Western Virginia. His victory is smaller than his vanity. Yet to a North galled by successive defeats, his bravado brings a new tonic of hope. Even Congress feels a surge of confidence. At last convened in July, it expects early victory, quickly grants Lincoln's demands for money and men to wage the war. As the North hardens toward the rebels, the grand issues of the war are often vague to the young men who must fight it. Hardly knowing how to load their guns, they confidently expect a quick battle, the glory of victory, and then home. The North has most of the factories, most of the men, most of everything. How can them Reds expect to win the war? I joined for 90 days. Figured that ought to give us plenty of time to take Richmond at a slow walk. <laughs> We better. I promised my girl I'd be back to get married by the end of summer. <laughs> At last, on July 18th, pushed by impatient cries of forward to Richmond, the raw Union Army moves against the rebels waiting 30 miles away at Manassas. Eager to watch the grand spectacle of young men in battle, government officials and their ladies have driven down from the capital, hoping for a victory before dinner time. Confederates are taking a beating, but now, late in the afternoon, the picnickers are disturbed by more ominous signs. The Union Army is on the run.
by hour through the night, the dimensions of the disaster grow. Into Washington come the remnants of the shattered Union Army, finding refuge even in the rotunda of the Capitol itself. In seven hours of battle, the Union has lost 2,900 brave but little trained men. The South, nearly as many. Once again, despair grips the North. Like the nation itself, Lincoln is on trial. He has sought to avoid war, but war has come. He has hoped for quick victory, and havoc has been the answer. He has pledged to save the Union at any cost, and the price appalls him. I'll be right there. Here's, here's me help, please. Yet he will not turn back. In crisis four months after his inauguration, Lincoln prepares for a harder war, turns now to the one military man he hopes can win it. Within hours, on urgent summons from Lincoln, young General McClellan leaves his mountain headquarters to take command of the Army of the Potomac. Entrusted with the nation's most important fighting force, he is certain of his destiny, sees himself as the legendary hero riding to rescue his country. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, man. Yet he is a man of divided purpose. Assigned to win the war, he supports the slavery which has caused it. Fighting for the Union, he favors the terms the South demands. All too soon, those contradictions will bring McClellan into open collision, not only with the Southern rebels, but with the president and the nation whose flag he has agreed to serve. years ago, almost all work was done by men's muscles and the stamina of beasts. As America changed, machines took over most of our hard work. Machines that needed fuel, most of it made for petroleum. And as our population expanded and our needs increased, so did the demand for more machines and the fuel to run them. Machines that harvest our crops. Machines that fly us to distant cities. Machines that take us to our jobs. Machinery that heats our homes and schools. Machinery that generates the electricity to cool our offices. And as much as America has changed, so has the rest of the world. Europe and Japan have used vast amounts of energy. This unprecedented demand, now aggravated by reduced imports from abroad, has created the shortages of fuel you're experiencing now. At Texaco, we're working to help solve these shortages. We're searching for and finding new supplies of crude oil. Our refineries are working to make the kinds of fuel you need. We're doing everything we can to get these fuels to you. At Texaco, we're working to keep your trust. August 3rd, 1861. Disastrously beaten at Manassas, Lincoln must repair Union prestige at the White House. Accompanied by aging General-in-Chief Winfield Scott, the dashing McClellan is presented as the Union's new military champion to the assembled dignitaries, among them England's minister, Lord Lyon, and France's visiting Prince Napoleon. It is critically important to impress the foreign emissaries. Their reports of Union strength, Lincoln knows, may well decide whether their countries will intervene on the side of the South. Even skeptics agree that at last Lincoln has found a winner. Hardly arrived in Washington, McClellan is hailed by cabinet, Congress, and the press. Despite his advocacy of slavery, few question his devotion to the Union. Already, admirers predict he will be the next president of the United States. What's your name, son? Schmitzer. McClellan knows that to win a war, a commanding officer must first win the trust of the men who will fight it. Like a saber, huh? What's your name? Schmitzer. 
your name, soldier? Waters. Waters. How old are you? 31. How many miles have you marched in the last two days? Oh, about 15. <laughs> you ready for 50 more? Hey, yes, sir. Good. Your name? Buck, sir. Buck. Fast as a buck deer, eh? Yes, sir. <laughs> Patiently, steadily, he reorganizes an army demoralized by defeat, begins to hammer it into a disciplined force. Respecting his men, they respect him. Given back their pride and spirit, they reward McClellan with a full and loyal devotion which will never be broken. Come right, first, half, half, guide in, split on in. Confident in his new general, Lincoln dares brief escape from the burdens of war. Fearless in mischief, his sons Willie and Tad are the terrors of the White House staff. Yet it is with them that Lincoln finds his rare moments of delight. How are you doing this morning? Huh? Oh, uh, uh. <laughs> McClellan the hero conceals a man less visible, a spoiled and often uncertain man revealed only to his wife, Ellen. Dazzled by sudden acclaim, he soon arrogantly challenges the nation's leaders. In his first weeks in the capital, he writes to his wife. I am here in a terrible place. The enemy have from three to four times my force. The president is an idiot. He will not see the true state of affairs. How can I save this country when stopped by General Scott? I do not know whether he is a dotard or a traitor. If he cannot be taken out of my path, I will resign and let the administration take care of itself. By some magic, I seem to have become the power of the land. I almost think that I could become dictator or anything else that might please me. But as the months drag on, caution replaces action. As the Union Army remains in camp, questions are raised. In McClellan's sudden rise to power, has he become paralyzed by fear of failure? Has he lost his nerve? Remembering his pro-slavery views, some even begin to doubt his eagerness to win the war. Vainly hoping to prod the reluctant general, even the president is turned away, told that McClellan is exhausted and cannot see him. Yet while the army stays idle, Lincoln must defend his general against a growing chorus of critics. Any attempt to put down the rebellion and at the same time uphold its inciting causes is preposterous. A any army officer still devoted to slavery is only half loyal to the Union. Every hour of deference to slavery is an added hour of peril for the Union. We have a trained army, but no campaigns. We have plans, but no battles. How can this nation abide the secret counsel that one man, McClellan, carries in his head when we have no evidence that he is the wisest man in the world? Unless the Union wins a prompt and convincing military success, the English government will almost certainly recognize the Confederacy. But nowhere on the 1,000-mile front is a quick victory in sight. Trying to outrace events, Lincoln summons a war council, tells McClellan now claiming illness, that if the general isn't going to use his army, he would like to borrow it. His leadership threatened, McClellan makes an abrupt recovery. Bowing at last to pressure from the president and a hostile cabinet, McClellan now proposes a massive single stroke, a waterborne invasion to seize the Confederate capital at Richmond and end the war. Lincoln is skeptical, fearing the maneuver will leave Washington itself exposed to massive Confederate attack. But grateful for any promise of decisive action, Lincoln finally accepts the plan. Leaving a token force to defend Washington, McClellan in mid-March will sail down Chesapeake Bay, land his army at Fort Monroe, 
then swiftly move on to Richmond, 85 miles away. Late in March, 1862, the first of McClellan's 85,000 troops reached the Virginia coast near Fort Monroe. Quickly, the Union patrols fan out, widening the beachhead, trying to make contact with the enemy. Wary of ambush, they advance slowly through the unfamiliar tidewater brush. The southern rebels they have learned are as elusive as panthers and more dangerous. the enemy they find. Slave freedom is still only a whispered word, yet day by day through the Union lines, black runaways seek sanctuary. Come join the Union Army. <laughs> it's not the enemy at all, I'm sure. Already great camps of fugitives are springing up. Over the nation hangs a question that increasingly demands a response. What is to be done with them? Only one man can make the answer. Beset by abolitionist delegations, Lincoln believes slavery a cancer. It must be removed, but how? Does the president have the constitutional authority? Does he dare risk the loyalty of the slave-owning border states? Any decision is hemmed by vast dangers. Escaped slave and black spokesman, Frederick Douglass, also brings to the president demands for Negro freedom too long delayed. Mr. Douglas. I was the only black there among the whites, but I didn't have to wait. The President of the United States received me as one gentleman by another. He had heard of my criticism of his hesitating policy toward the Negro. He admitted he might have been a little slow. He argued that the people had to be prepared for change. Then he said, Mr. Douglas, I don't think it can be shown that once I have taken a position, I have ever retreated from it. Daily, it seems clearer that the cause of national survival and slave freedom are one and the same. Yet as he fights for the life of the Union, Lincoln silently bears a private sorrow, the death of his son, Willie. I have always thought all men should be free. On the Ohio River uh, years ago, I have seen slaves shackled together with irons, and it was a torment to me. As I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. Yet, as we are now situated, would my word free the slaves when I cannot even enforce the Constitution in the rebel states? I have hoped for a moderate solution. Uh, to the people of the border states, I have offered to buy the freedom of their slaves at $400 apiece. To buy the freedom of all the slaves would uh, cost far less than the war, but uh, nothing has come up. I can tell you this subject is on my mind more than any other. Whatever shall appear to be God's will, I will do. But outside Richmond, history is being written slowly, and the will of God is hard to read. While God and the generals make up their minds, the soldier can only wait. Slowed by its heavy siege guns and its commander's cautious tactics, the Union march from the Chesapeake to the gates of the Confederate capital has taken months instead of days. As McClellan's soldiers stand picket duty, the South gathers its outnumbered forces and appoints a new army commander. Robert E. Lee. Now the general who will gamble nothing faces a general ready to risk all. While McClellan prepares the siege, Lee plans a war maneuver. 
The martial sounds at Richmond are all theatrical effects. Lee is not there. On June 25th, miles to the north, he strikes. Risking only a token force in Richmond, Lee sweeps onto McClellan's flank and rear. Divided by a rain-swollen river, McClellan's forces cannot support each other. In a dozen scattered battles, Lee tightens his lines on the Union troops, driving them into swamp and pockets. brilliant lead. Pushed by an army far smaller than his own, McClellan pulls back in seven days of brutal fighting. Unaccountably orders retreat, even when his lines finally hold. At least one fiery Union general protests a retreat. The famed warrior, it's Philip Kearney. Instead of retreating, we are to follow up the troops and take Richmond. In full view of the responsibilities of such a declaration, I, Philip Kearney, say to you all, such an order could only be prompted by cowardice or treason. Protected at last by Union gunboats on the James River, McClellan blames Lincoln for lack of reinforcements. I owe no gratitude, he writes bitterly, to the government or to the country. Patient in despair, Lincoln tries to mend the disaster, visits McClellan, seeking a new plan to salvage the Richmond campaign. Incredibly, the general presents a memorandum denouncing any Union attempt to abolish slavery. Yet McClellan's retreat will itself force the president's hand. Now facing a prolonged war, Lincoln knows he can only sustain Union determination by giving it the very purpose McClellan opposes, converting the struggle into a moral crusade against slavery. Against growing Northern apathy, against possible foreign intervention, Lincoln prepares, as he says, to play my last card. Secretary of State Seward remembers. It was July 22nd when the president gave each of the cabinet a draft of the Emancipation Proclamation. In a way, it wasn't a very strong document. After all, it applied only to the slaves beyond our control. But freedom is a mighty strong word. And after you've said it, it is hard to stop. I strongly suggested a delay. After a defeat, the proclamation may seem like a plea for slave revolt, a desperate act of a losing government. Lincoln immediately agreed to wait for a victory. At the time, victory seemed to be very far off. Lee was marching north again, threatening General Pope's forces outside Washington. Stunned, McClellan is ordered north to help Pope's army defending the approaches to the capital. Forced to abandon the Richmond campaign, McClellan's staff angrily talks of rebellion. Even the general considers a drastic step. I am urged to march on Washington and assume the government, he writes. Perhaps I should then be treated with rather more politeness. Yet slowly and reluctantly, the general begins to oblige his orders too slowly to prevent a new disaster. On August 26th, in lightning attack, Confederate General Stonewall Jackson destroys the Union supply dump of Manassas, scene of Northern defeat a year ago. But the raid is only the first blow by Lee's swiftly converging forces. Desperately, General Pope awaits help from McClellan's army. Once again, the nation's fate hangs in the balance. Lincoln's hopes also hang on the battle now beginning within earshot of the Capitol itself. In his desk lie the first draft pages of the Emancipation Proclamation. 
Only Union victory can give them life. Without victory, they will remain no more than paper. When we were an infant nation, the sea was a part of our defenses that helped keep foreign powers out. But the sea was important to us in other ways, too. In the early 1800s, America's only source of oil swam in the ocean. But over the next 75 years, America's need for oil changed and expanded, as she did. And during the last 25 years or so, petroleum has become America's prime fuel. But today, while eight out of nine exploratory wells drilled don't produce any oil at all, our need for oil is even greater than ever. Since it's becoming harder to find oil on land in this country, we return to the sea. Because geologists tell us that beneath the sea lie some of the largest potential oil fields known to man. But instead of returning in an old-fashioned square rigger, we return with a sophisticated drilling rig. And instead of a 20-foot harpoon, we use thousands of feet of drill pipe. At Texaco, we share the old whaler's respect for the sea. So we're very careful. On every rig, highly trained technicians use dozens of electronic safety devices, sensors, and monitors. Where men can't see, Underwater TV cameras are watching for them. And on the well itself sits a blowout preventer that can shut down a well in seconds. At Texaco, when we tap the resources beneath the sea, we do everything we can not to harm the things that live in it. At Texaco, we are working to keep your trust. A diabolical plot for mayhem at 10.30. Once again, Lincoln is denied his victory. Once again, the survivors of a crushing Union defeat take the road back from Manassas. Waiting for help from McClellan, General Pope has waited in vain. In the crisis, McClellan has dawdled and delayed. He has turned back advance units marching to the front, rested troops a full day within a mile of the battle. Now in Washington, there is uproar against him. In Secretary of War Stanton's office, furious accusations. To a man, the cabinet demands McClellan's dismissal. Can you hear Mr. Secretary, do you have any comment on the defeat of Manassas? We will be. Sir, there is a talk of treason. Is there any truth in it? I'm aware of questions raised about the battle at Manassas. Inquiries are being made into the causes of the defeat. Is it true that General McClellan is being relieved? There are no changes in command. Such a decision is, of course, up to the commander-in-chief. Lincoln has ample cause to dismiss McClellan. The general has opposed his policies, is widely distrusted. At the very least, his incompetence is largely responsible for defeat at Richmond and Manassas. Yet Lincoln takes a calculated risk. He keeps McClellan in command, puts his hope of the future in the man most reluctant to meet it. There is little choice. Burdened with second-rate generals, Lincoln has no replacement, and time is of the essence. Already, Lee has crossed the Potomac and driven into Maryland, threatening a deeper invasion of the North. Unless he is beaten quickly, the Union has lost the war. Fire! Kept in command despite the outcry against him, McClellan celebrates it as a personal triumph. He parades his army, not past the White House, but before his own residence so that he, and not the president, will receive the soldiers' tears. In early September, the luckless army of the Potomac once again marches off in search of victory.
But victory or defeat lies partly with an elusive enemy named Robert E. Lee. And first McClellan has to find him, somewhere to the west, beyond the blue ridges of western Maryland. Hardly 50 miles from Washington, his movements masked by the mountains, Lee prepares a daring gamble to win the war on the North's own ground. He has beaten the slow-moving McClellan once, and he intends to do it again. But now, a fateful accident of war puts Confederate plans in McClellan's hands, gives him the weapon to defeat Lee once and for all. Corporal Barton Mitchell recalls. It was just a big, fat envelope. We just had a skirmish with some Reb cavalry, and afterwards, me and Sergeant Bloss is sitting there smoking and resting and smoking our pipes, and well, that's when I saw it. Inside, there was three cigars wrapped in a message from Lee's headquarters to one of the other Reb generals. I gave it to the captain, and quick as a flash, General McClellan had it. One of the fellers at headquarters, he recognized... In detail, the secret orders reveal the positions of Lee's dangerously scattered troops. Stonewall Jackson is preparing to storm Harper's Ferry. Lee and Longstreet are 35 miles north at Hagerstown. D.H. Hill, near Boonesboro. McClellan is closer to each than they are to each other. If McClellan moves instantly, marches his troops by night, he can destroy Lee's separated units one by one and win the war. Instead, he gives his soldiers a good night's sleep and waits till morning. Outnumbering the enemy more than two to one, McClellan has 87,000 men against Lee's divided army of 40,000. Yet he will move with painful caution take three days to march 20 miles, to clear the ridges of scattered Confederate resistance and move into the valley beyond. Three days in which his alarmed foe can begin hastily to assemble his forces near a little Maryland town called Sharpsburg. Even then, at last confronting only a fragment of Lee's forces, hardly 18,000 men, McClellan again delays for a full day, perfecting his plans, he says. Finally, on the night of September 16th, advanced units of Union soldiers quietly ford Antietam Creek and make bivouac. Somewhere beyond the cornfield, the Confederate Army prepares. At dawn, by forced marches, Lee will have gathered 25,000 men. Before the battle's end, he will have all 40,000. But for the Union soldiers, the dark hours will be slow and long. At the White House, Lincoln also does not sleep. To McClellan, on the eve of the battle that may be the war's turning point, he has sent a message. God bless you and all with you. Destroy the rebel army if possible. Now the event is beyond presidential power. Lincoln can only wait. the bloodiest day of the war. Before nightfall of September 17, 1862, 23,000 men, Union and Confederate, will lie dead or wounded along Antietam Creek, along its side roads and little woods, and many of them in the hell of Farmer Miller's 40-acre corn patch. Charge and countercharge, the tide of battle shifts. Despite his overwhelming forces, still fearful that Lee outnumbers him, McClellan commits his units piecemeal, holds back the reserves that could smash the Confederate Army forever. And men die. Amid the curtains of growing corn, they grope blindly for enemies they cannot see. Each orderly row conceals a sudden step into eternity. Afterward, soldiers will tell that the sun seemed almost to go backward, and it appeared as if night would never come. the 
death of this day, Lee's army is not destroyed. He has been saved by the valor of his men and by McClellan's caution. Not once has the Union commander massed his forces for a decisive blow. Yet for Lee, even a standoff is a defeat. He has lost his gamble for victory, a gamble he cannot afford. Now he must turn south in retreat. Yet for a day, the two battered armies face each other across the silent fields. The farmer's corn patch has yielded a different harvest. Once again, the Telegraph reports the count, not of election votes, but of the dead at Antietam. Lincoln has gotten his victory. Now, overwhelmed by the cost, his answer must be worthy of it. Five days after the battle, he meets with the cabinet. Later, the president himself will recall. I've always had a particular fondness for Artemis Ward. In these times, laughter is uh, hard to come by. So I uh, told a funny story. The cabinet members appeared to enjoy it, uh, all except Secretary Stanton. Uh, Mr. Stanton is a very proper man. I think he felt the story was out of style with the tone of the occasion, but maybe it was. I told the cabinet that while I waited for word from uh, General McClellan, I had made a covenant with God. A victory over Lee would mean that God intended the slaves to be free and I would guide myself accordingly. It uh, might seem strange, but that is how it was. Now, Lee was beaten and the meaning was clear. God had decided this question in favor of the slaves. Then I uh, read the proclamation. That on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then thenceforward and forever free. And the executive government of the United States will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons and will do no act or acts to repress such persons or any of them in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom. Now, the fated hero says goodbye. After weeks of delay, McClellan has failed in a listless and futile pursuit of the rebel forces. Lee has escaped. At last, in early November, weary of his general, weary of the rebellious talk in the army he has called McClellan's bodyguard, Lincoln removes him from command and orders him home. Again, there are a few urgings for a march on Washington. McClellan's partial victory at Antietam has gained the very end he has bitterly opposed, Lincoln's promise of slave freedom. In their ironic clash of wills, the president has triumphed. Yet, 
in his final moments, McClellan wisely bows to his soldier's duty and to the forces of a history he neither welcomes nor understands. He rides out of the army forever. At Antietam, the land has begun to heal, return to its ancient uses. Another spring will come. The farmer's straight rows will green again. Only America has changed. Death and its endless rounds has passed on to other fields, to other appointments in other places, will one day strike down the man who now mourns the lives that ended here. But his actions cannot be erased. In giving freedom to the slave, he has said, we assure freedom to the free. Lincoln knows that the nation's union may be forced by blood and steel, yet it can only endure by a common faith. Victories are not only a gift of the dead. Victories are what the living make of them. We will return with the conclusion of Lincoln trial by fire after this message from Texaco. The river, a lifeline to the city inland, a road on which the energy the city needs travels. This is the Texaco Marfac, today's riverboat. In command, Captain Dick Riley. First of all, I love the Connecticut River, the natural beauty of it. So you strive uh, to keep it looking the way it was intended to look. You're aware of how important the ecology is. You make sure that every measure is used to uh, ensure the safety of uh, the tow, yourself, and the vessel, and your crew. We tow a barge uh, with a capacity of 36,000 barrels uh, of varied products. I'm talking uh, about over a million gallons of product. Five years, over five years, I've been captain of the Marfa. There are more than 75,000 people working at Texaco. This was the story of one of them, Texaco people, working to help solve this country's energy problems, working to supply your energy needs. The war went on, of course. Beyond compromise, men would still fight and die at Vicksburg, Chattanooga, Atlanta, Gettysburg. But the central decision had been made, a decision that still rings in the American conscience. Freedom was a pledge not to some, but to all. It was bought by trial and risk, by the struggle between a president and his general, even by a message wrapped around three cigars somewhere on the road to Antietam. General McClellan would never return to battle. Yet he would again challenge Lincoln as a presidential candidate in the election of 1864. Badly defeated, he would dwindle into history an obscure, half-forgotten figure. Abe Lincoln remains perhaps the most loved of presidents. In the still unfinished journey of America, he set the way. His own journey from Springfield would go farther than he knew. Learning his role as he played it, he would often stumble. Yet in the nation's anguish and his own, he would find a meaning that endured. Now, dead by an assassin's bullet, Lincoln went back to Springfield, back over the road he had come, waiting in silent homage to the president they had so often abused. The people tried to touch memory, tried to remember what it was that had compelled their devotion. Was it the homely phrase, the frontier joke, the words that gave order to our beliefs? Was it the haunted face that mirrored the nation's suffering? Was it the bone-deep courage, the patience, his refusal to hate? The question was hard to answer.
as little, he had once said, to tell about himself. Yet, we knew him. We saw in him the majesty of ordinary men. Through him, learned that we were bigger than we knew. The most uncommon of common men, he had led us into the fight. In his courage and faith, we found our own. In 1917, two million young Americans under the command of an old Indian fighter are heading over there to fight the war to end all wars. We invite you to join us in April when Texaco presents The American Heritage, the unforgettable story of two men in World War I who fought for democratic ideals, each in his own way. One, the supreme commander of the American Expeditionary Forces, Black Jack Pershing. The other, a small-town American doughboy. Victorious on an ancient European battlefield, America emerges from its age of innocence to become a major world power. Clint Eastwood stars as the man with no name in the action-packed Western for a few dollars more. The Sunday night movie next. Stay tuned. A classy chassis hides a bum engine. Richie and Potsy get a lemon, and their happy days have some unhappy moments. Tuesday night at 8.